Um, we're going to go ahead and start with Jerome um, today. Our speakers, just to kind of give you guys, you know, a little um, information about tonight's meeting. We are going to be talking about multifamily investing, of course. Um, this is something a lot of people want to know about. And um, we sought out the best of the best, in my opinion. I did a little research. Uh, I have not met these guys um, in person, so this will be my first time hearing from them, but I have done a lot of re research on them. Um, Jerome, I'm going to go ahead and let you take the floor, the computer. Sounds like a mistake. But a mistake? We will do. We'll just keep blaming Uwe. <laughs> nah, I take, I take full control <laughs> and, uh, responsibility for all things that happen. Uh, well, that is good. That's so, all right. Well, we're going to go ahead and start, and I'll move out the way. Cool beans. I know you guys said 20 minutes. I'm going to do my best. And we'll run through this prepared content, and then I guess we'll circle back for Q and A later on if that works. Still, right? Yes. No. Oh, so when they go off the screen, they go silent. So I'm just going to run with it until somebody tells me to stop. So I appreciate everybody showing up. We're going to run through what the Myers methods of multifamily investing is. Um, some people may be asking questions. I'm presenting. My name is Jerome Myers. And we're just going to run through a few topics really quickly. Like I said, we got about 18 minutes or so of prepared content. Do an intro of Myers Methods, run through Roblox and the getting into multifamily. Talk about my big mistakes. I feel like nobody talks about mistakes, and I feel like people learn more from mistakes than successes. So we'll talk about those. Um, promote our conference that's happening July 31st through August 2nd down here in Greensboro, North Carolina. Give you guys some free resources. Um, talk about the differences between JVs and syndications, and I'll open it up for Q&A either right after or towards the end of the conversation. I got a disclaimer on the bottom. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not a CPA. I'm not an attorney. So don't use anything I tell you to go do anything, because if you do and then you blame it on me, I'm going to tell you I don't know what I'm doing. So a lot of people have read the Little Purple Book, right? And in the Purple Book, you've got the cash flow quadrant. And Kiyosaki talks about the different ways people make money. I adapted this and took it to the multifamily space. And so when you think about employees, you'll see a community manager. And so two days ago, I was sitting with a community manager that helps us out with one of our properties. And she was talking to me about going to court and how she got somebody else to lease a unit and this, that, and a third. And those are the type of things that employees deal with on a daily basis. Um, her boss, the property manager, the owner of that company is self-employed. So he was somebody who worked for a Fortune 500 company as an executive. He left, wanted to join real estate full time, open up a property management company. And they've been doing that for about 15 years. Um, a business owner, what is something different than that. For business owners, we own a system and people work for us. Um, you know, when we collected um, north of $50,000 in rent last month, I didn't have anything to do with that, right? So that money was picked up, it was put in the bank, we paid bills, and the distribution checks came out on the other side of that. Um, for us, and when I say us, it's all the joint venture partners on the different projects that we buy, we own a system and we have people who work for us. And then the final step is a passive investor. And this is a spot where Taylor sits, where he's got his money working for him. And so he's investing in different syndications and talking to operators all around the country. And so what we've decided is, you know, you start out as an employee that fills, fuels your career and you either can go to self-employed or business owner, but this is where wealth is created. It's in ownership. And then you take that ownership and you turn it into an investment. And so we are in the wealth building process. And so we sit over here in this ownership space. Um, so I didn't actually make up Myers Methods. One of my best friends, coach, confidant, a guy named James Bryant, who lives in the Richmond, Virginia market, came up with the term. As we were systematically um, putting together our system, he started to say, hey, we're using the Myers Methods, we're using the Myers Methods, and it finally stuck, and we started to share our philosophy and approach with other folks. Um, it's based on three pillars. First, preservation of capital. 
Um, as you see, people are pretty frantic in the market today uh, with coronavirus and worrying about the economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What you will see is the folks who are wealthiest tend to be the most fearful. They run, they hoard, they back away from the table where folks who are trying to make it seem to be more interested or have a higher risk tolerance. And so we want to preserve capital for those people who are making it, as well as for those people who already have it because they partner with us on deals as well. We look for asymmetrical returns. So we want to take a small risk and get a big return, uh, whether it's buying an asset under market value. And that's really what we like to do. But also on our value add strategies, you know, we want to be able to clearly identify what the problem is, know what the solution is before we get into the deal, and then execute aggressively against that strategy. Um, and then the, fast, the last piece is community improvement. Um, we're, we believe in doing good while doing well. It's our form of altruistic investment. And so not only do we want to make great returns for our investors and partners, but we want to make a positive impact in the community. Um, and the way James characterizes this is he wants to make a positive impact on 500 families that live in our communities over the, the next five years. Um, the big thing that we really want to impute into other people when we have these conversations is all about creating time and location freedom. If you have to be in a certain place at a certain time, you are not free. If you got to go to work every day, you're not free. And so we want to help people create freedom so that they can spend their time doing the things that they enjoy most. And just to put it all a bow on it, this is a four step process. We find it, we fund it, we fix it and we flip it. The it is always some type of workforce housing in a multifamily space. Uh, so the challenges of getting into multifamily, we found that there are four challenges that everybody deals with. Most people don't deal with them in order. A lot of people go to the tip of the pyramid, which is capital, and say they need to figure that out first. We believe that's the last thing you need to worry about. First, you need to get educated, so you need knowledge. After you have knowledge, you can get into deal flow. Once you have deal flow, you need experience, and once you have experience, you'll get the capital. If you don't know what a deal is, and so deals and leads have the, all the same letters in them. They're arranged differently from a spelling perspective, but they're the exact same. They, people confuse deals and leads. They are not the same thing. A lead is something you might be, a deal is something you should buy. If you know that you have a deal, then you need to go find an experienced partner so that you can get the other folks who have the capital, if you're not capital um, wealthy at this time, to come to the deal. And then capital is always looking for experienced operators with a great deal to partner with, because if they're an investor, they don't want the responsibility of actually executing the deal. I won't go through all of these. Take a screenshot if you want to grab these. Um, just in general, there are two major ways to fund um, these projects. They're either joint ventures or syndications. Our group is really deeply focused on joint ventures. Syndications are nice, but from my background of, and the way I grew up, the people that I've met, joint ventures fit better for us. Um, it, for us, in this space, particularly at this juncture, right, we want to help people get into the space, right? And so we're looking to help people get that experience box checked. When I left corporate America, I was a corporate America dropout. I dropped out in 2016. Um, I didn't have any experience. And so I went to all the different banks. I was like, hey, I, I just built a $20 million business for a Fortune 500 company. They were like, so what? I said, I got an MBA. So I've got a professional engineering uh, license. They didn't care about any of that stuff. They wanted to know, had I done a value add multifamily investment before? And the answer to that was no. And they said, so our answer to you is no, we're not going to invest in your dream. You need to go get somebody who's done this before to be your partner. After I got my that box check, everybody wanted to talk to me. We had a press release. I had all the lenders, different, call, different lenders calling me. They want to know what the next deal was. They want to know if they could refi the deal we just did. And out of that, we created some great relationships with folks. But I knew nothing more the day after we closed than the day before we closed. And But I had the experience box checked at that point. With joint ventures, you have voting rights. Um, syndications, you can come in as a limited partner. It's no different than really buying a stock except it's liquid, right? And so imagine calling up bill gates or somebody who's running a fortune 500 company that you just bought stocks in and wanting to tell them what you think they don't care um same thing with the syndication you're getting on the plane you're not a part of the team um you're putting your money in and waiting for that return to come back 
Um, the cons with joint ventures, less resolution on vacancy. Typically joint venture deals are small, smaller than the large deals. Most in it, a lot of syndications I've seen, typically they look for assets that are over, over 100 units. Um, for joint ventures, I see the model trending towards stuff that's under 75 units. And then there's kind of this little gray debt space in between. Um, joint ventures are typically gonna have recourse debt. Syndications are typically gonna have non-recourse debt. And that becomes important as your portfolio, or your net worth grows. Um, the only other thing I will say, when you're looking at deals, um, don't try to go kill Moby Dick on your first deal, right? If you're going to go do a deal and all you own is a single family home, don't think that you're going to go take down a $10 million deal by yourself. It's just not realistic. There's gurus out here telling you that, hey, you can do this, you can do that. I'm telling you from experience that the reality is you're probably going to do a deal somewhere between 500000 and $1.5 million on your first multifamily deal if you've got some people around you that can help guide you through the process. Um, how I got here, when I dropped out of corporate America, I started a financial independence movement where I wanted to partner with the 100 people to buy a 1,000 doors of workforce housing so that all of us could leave the workplace and just focus on working on the things that we're most passionate about. Um, I do three things with my time now. I help educate people through Myers Methods. I operate my real estate investment business and construction company. And I have a peak performance consulting company for individuals called Dreamcatchers. Uh, got a bunch of different certifications and stuff, but you know that stuff doesn't really matter. Um, today, I asset manage about 90 units across the Mid-Atlantic, um, put together the Myers Methods of Multifamily Investment. Um, We've got a 100 unit development deal going here in Greensboro. We've got another 66 under contract here. Um, and before, like I said, before I left corporate America, I built a $20 million business. Uh, we had about 30% profit margin. And to date, our team has put together a little over a million dollars in um, capital to take down the different deals that we own. Um, we talked about altruistic investment. I won't go through everything on this slide. I will just tell you that when you start getting into due diligence, you will find some heartbreaking stories. What we found is that owners have cognitive dissonance when it comes to their residents. And if for some reason, if people don't look like the owner, they tend to be okay with leaving things lackluster. And that's how you end up with people who get called slumlords. Um, and I'm really careful about the way I throw that around because not everything is as it seems or how it is sensationalized. Um, so how did I get started? Just run through like four slides on what happened for me. I got started. I had a knowledge gap. I didn't know that I had a knowledge gap. I thought I could just walk in and do it. But when I figured out that I did, I started doing podcasts, books, YouTube. Maria never really talked about it. So you guys at Chesterfield, I, I really applaud you because the folks that um, or down here in Greensboro don't really have that many conversations about multifamily, although I think it's probably the best real estate investment right now. Um, most days I ended up feeling confused, overwhelmed, overconfident, and frustrated. Um, you, If I'm listening to 10 different podcasts and one guy says this and another guy says that, who do I believe and how do I know who to believe, right? Um, for the books, you know, everybody's got their different approach. YouTube, there's some people who are really doing this business, others who just want to be educators. And there's a big difference between people who do this business and those who just teach something that they put in a book. Um, and then the re, I didn't even know who to talk to. So it was really frustrating for me. Um, I, when I started getting into the deal flow stuff, I, I was looking on LoopNet. Um, I started a direct mail campaign. So anybody who's a wholesaler, every technique that you use to get deals are applicable in multifamily. Um, and then the other deals come through networking. Um, for my experience, you know, I had to personally guarantee a loan and I just didn't have that. Uh, the bank denied me about 10 times. They told me my corporate experience didn't matter. Hard money said no because either there wasn't enough meat on the bone or they didn't think my track record was strong enough. Uh, private money lenders in my network, they, they didn't want to participate. And most of them didn't really understand self-directed IRAs. And I didn't know anyone who owned multifamily. What I should have did, I should have went to conferences. Um, I could have taken one of those thirty or $40,000 courses that those um, gurus offer 
and potentially could have been in like LinkedIn or Facebook groups. And that would have gotten me surrounded by people who had the actual experience. Um, from a capital standpoint, you know, I had some savings outside of my 401k, I had access to some credit lines, I had a whole life policy with some cash value. Um, other thing that I put in my package when I was going to the bank was my W-2 from my last year of working. And then the rest of the capital came from friends and family. Um, some of our partners are people that I went to high school with and played high school football with. Um, and so let's just dive into my most costly mistakes, right? Um, I'm self-taught. I never went to anybody's course. And, you know, I've listened to podcasts, I've read books, I've been to a conference or two, but what I, the conference that I went to, the last one that I went to, it was just a pitch fest. They weren't actually teaching me how to invest in multifamily. Um, it was probably the most inefficient and effective way to do it, right? I, I listened to 40 hours of content. Um, I made a lot of modeling mistakes. I underestimated rehab budgets. I picked a property manager that wasn't the right person for the asset that we owned. And what you will learn as you get deeper into this is that the property manager will make or break your project. Um, and so one thing I didn't, let me just dive a little bit deeper on it. So the syndications in the JV, when I think about a syndication, imagine get on a plane, and you look in the cockpit, you got a pilot, co-pilot, you got the stewardess, and those folks get paid to be on the plane. That's the same thing that happens in a syndication. You have something called a general partnership. It's responsible for operating the plane, the plane being the multifamily business. Um, and then you have all the passengers that get on the plane. They pay to get on the plane. They pay the general partnership to operate the plane, get them there safely. Uh, in that situation, when you take it to syndication, those are the limited partners. They put a dollar in, they get 80 to 60, or let me say it differently, they get 65 to 80% equity for every dollar that they put into the deal. And so that spread, that difference goes to the general partnership. Um, you know, the sponsor is responsible for finding the deal, acquiring it, and then managing it. Um, if you choose to be a, a limited partner, it's, you just bought a illiquid security. And so I tell people, if your interest is getting into multifamily and you want to be an operator, do not tie up your money for five years as a limited partner in a deal. Keep that money out and find a joint venture. And so when I think about a joint venture, it is... Um, like flying a fighter jet. And I want to be a fighter jet pilot when I was a kid, right? Um, everybody's got an active role. There are no, you know, passive passengers on a fighter jet. Um, you know, everybody's got the opportunity to vote. More often than not, you have to sign the loan. So that gets your experience box checked. But at the end of the day, just know that you are becoming a partner in a business. Um, we are doing the Mid-Atlantic Multifamily Investing Conference, July 31st through August 2nd. Um, here's a bunch of speakers. One of the things that we're really proud about is bringing you guys a diverse lineup. Um, you won't find another conference in the country that has people from so many different backgrounds presenting on this one specific topic. And so if you have any interest in joining us, um, you can buy tickets on Eventbrite or you can hit myersmethods.com forward slash con 2020 and get to network and engage with my multifamily friends. We've, right now we've got about 18 speakers coming through and they're just going to share a ton, a ton of value there. This is a no pitch opportunity to learn about multifamily investing, learn about mindset, learn about entrepreneurship. Um, I am the only person that has something to sell, right? We do have a course that people can get into. Um, we're not going to pitch it from stage at the conference, but the fact of the matter is I just wanted to bring the people in that I know, and some of them are graduates from our course, others are people that we've done deals with, our property manager in the market is coming in. Um, we've got my man Pankaj coming through. Him and his dad just did a $50 million deal. Just him and his dad. Um, and that all, he's gonna tell a story on how they got to the place where they can do massive deals like that. Um, my man James is there. Um, so it's gonna be an amazing event. Definitely encourage you guys to lock in and you know come down and fellowship with a great group of folks from all over the country and will's my banker he works at virginia community capital um they've done four loans with us and it's just been a great experience to work with them um some free resources you can hop over to myersmethods.com and there you can get our free four-step guide 
Um, there's 15 minute uh, podcast interview that I did, just breaking all of it down. And then if you join our closed Facebook group on the backside of that, um, there's an opportunity to get two hours of multifamily training. Um, just for you know, us thanking you for being in it. I'm also the host of a podcast called Dreamcatchers. It's available on YouTube and all the podcasts and outlets. Um, would love to have you guys come in. We tell the story of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And you know, it's just something else to live up, um, lift up and create positivity. Um, from my perspective, you know, dreams should be real. And I just want to provide the world with examples of people who are actually doing that. So that is the end of my content. So let me know if I can answer any questions or are we moving to the next speaker? Just let me know what we're doing. You can go ahead and answer some questions if anyone has any questions. So we have to take them. So We're going to have to look at the chats. Yeah. Anyone has any questions for Jerome? Um, I think we have a little bit of a delay, but it doesn't show me the name. That's not on me. Yeah, I'm um, drawing. We have a, a small delay. So we'll just have to wait for the comments to come in. Uh, how much are your courses? No. Um, so we don't talk about it like that. So what happens is you got to talk to me. I don't, it's not available for everybody. Um, just because we approach this thing a lot different than what a lot of people do. So we got to make sure it's right there. We don't just, you can't find a link to it anywhere. It's, it's a personal conversation. So we, can, we, see if we think you're the right person for our techniques. And that is nice. But Phil, well, you, you can reach out to me at jerome at myusmethods.com and we can set up a conversation there. I can learn more about you and where you are in the space. I wish I could see the names. It just says Facebook user. Yeah, um, it shows the names on our end. Only actually asked that question. Um, any other questions? But what I will tell you guys about the course, I mean, it's an 11-week course. Um, you get one module a week. It's 25 hours of me lecturing plus another 25 hours or so of homework and other content. But then I'll have to actually read. So, um, any new advice for a movie investor? Get, get educated and don't do it away. Yeah, I, I haven't gotten another email from you since uh, you sent me that. Uh, you got like a couple of minutes ago. Let's try that one more time. So the, the leads, um, being able to determine whether or not you have a lead or a deal, you can go find a deal and then go take it. Hey, I think it's going to be a little Um, What's the best way to find a partner? Do you guys live or go on a search? I take my list from the GIS. So whatever the county GIS is, I, I download the entire list and then I search for the multifamilies off of that um, when I, I do a mailer. Um, I think the majority of deals, we've bought stuff off LoopNet. I don't think LoopNet is a place where deals go to buy. We've actually bought two. The last one that we bought off of LoopNet had um, $400,000. It appraised $400,000 over contract price, um, which we thought was a great, opportunity for us um so loop net Craxy, and then we also mail direct to owners we like being direct to seller that allows us to control our own deal flow back to the newbie question Come to the conference. 
get around people who are actually doing the business, ask them all the questions you want to ask them. That's why they're coming. Um, the speakers here, I mean, there's a difference between the VIP and the regular agenda, but the speakers here are coming because they want to see more people come into the space. It's not just so they can pitch you something. So definitely encourage you to come to the, to the conference and check that out. Um, and then get the free stuff. I'm giving away a free four step guide too. So jump on that. Questions. All right. We have one other question said, what number of units would you target to stop, to start, stop? It depends on you. And I, like, I assume most of you guys are in the Richmond market. Um, I think a lot of units in Richmond are trading between 50 and 125,000. And so depending on how um, pricey it is, it's going to have a big impact. I personally encourage you to partner with somebody. I, I don't really like things under 10 units. I think 10 is kind of the bottom, but you know, commercial loans are commercial loans. So if you get a five unit, you get an eight unit, you still have a commercial loan. So I think that's probably, you know, something to start with. Our first year was 23. So just put things in perspective. There are some people who go out and try to get the 100 unit deal and struggle for a really long time because there's people from all over the country looking for those deals. Smaller deals are pretty easy to grab. Uh, what what percentage of deals do you get from Crexy? Uh, Crexy and LoopNet almost have the same thing. Uh, just the deals that we've done, we've bought one, two off LoopNet, and then we've got another three off of direct mail and well i think take that back we got two off of direct mail and one off of networking is so pro forma method to analyze those so what i will tell you is if you don't know what you're doing the most dangerous thing you can do is go model a deal so get the education. Don't try to shortcut that piece of the process. Um, here's an example of how that doesn't work. And it's a failure on my part. The first deal that I bought in Greensboro, I modeled my taxes at $1,000. My taxes were $10,000. Um, for some people, that's not a lot of money. For other people, that's earth shattering. Um, fortunately, we made enough revenue at the property that it didn't really matter. But the fact of the matter is, I made a $9,000 error. The other piece of that is if you have some value add, if you've got a renovation, this isn't like a single family home. If you underestimate something by 2000 bucks, like we did, and then you multiply it by 20 or 25, that's $500,000 that you're off. A lot of people can't swing that. So spend time working with somebody who can look over your shoulder and make sure you're doing things right and they'd be willing to work with you on that pro forma piece. Um, will cold calling work for acquiring multifamily? I think the short answer is, yeah. I mean, I think every method that a wholesaler uses works. I think what happens more often than not is brokers who are listing properties are calling the owners of those properties. And so you can use that as a technique. I don't because I don't want to be actively engaged in the marketing after I find the address. And we don't have like VAs in the Philippines or anything, but yeah, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Cold calling, networking, um, all of those techniques work. Direct mail, all of them work. Yeah. All righty, guys. Uh, I think we have. I think that is the last question. Anybody so else? Taylor. Any other multifamily events? Oh, oh, are there any other multifamily events that you would recommend? Right. I don't see that question, but 
I don't, I don't have one. I'm sorry. I think like the only, there's only been two other ones that I've heard are really good, but I haven't been, so I can't speak from personal experience. The one is uh, the best ever real estate investing conference. It just went in February. That's Joe Paris's conference. And then Michael Blank had one in July called Real Maker. It, I got confused when I saw Jim Ingersoll and then I saw Michael Blank, but Michael Blank has one. I have out in Texas. And I will say that John Tasman, which is one of our speakers, he's at the Midwest um, Investing Summit, but you know, if you're not investing in the Midwest, I don't know if that's a good move for you. Um, but if you're open to looking and finding people from all over the country to work with, then that's probably some, a, a good opportunity for you to meet and greet with folks. Um, Rod Khalif has a boot camp that a lot of people go to. I don't know how much value people are getting from that. Um, but, you know, that, that's what I got to offer. 